I don't feel like I belong. But that's not always such a bad thing. How many of you here, at some point in your life, have felt like you don't belong to your community, a place, your family, or your nation? Think about it. Very impressive. Hold that feeling. So I want to share with you something I've hardly ever spoken about. I've never completely felt like I belong to any place or any community. That doesn't mean that I don't have people around me who provide me with love, friendship, and support. I do. Neither does it mean that I'm not attached to people and places. I am. It simply means that a big part of what I do and who I am is connected to this feeling I've always had of not quite a, a belonging, which has become something of a sensibility that steers and guides me through life. Having lived in Singapore for the first 24 years of my life, and then moving to London for the next seven years, and finally coming here to Toronto, where I've been for over 10 years. So what does it mean to say that I feel like I don't belong? Well, simply put, it means that I've been a minority wherever I've lived. It also means that my desire to belong has always been met with contradictory experiences in the places that I call home. For example, I felt or I've received racial slurs while I was in the army in Singapore by my peers. I've been told by taxi drivers in Singapore constantly, being asked, where are you from? And also, just simply looking around and not seeing anyone that looks like me in the positions of authority and power within the institutions that I have worked in, including this one. So obviously, this feeling of not quite belonging can be lonely, isolating, alienating, and even a very oppressive feeling. But today, I'd like to speak about what I call the benefits of not belonging. For me, it means a few things. It translates into a couple or three things. Firstly, it has made me keenly aware or observant of how belonging comes naturally or more easily for some people. It has made me also aware of how others might feel when they are marginalized, displaced, or simply left out of a conversation. And thirdly, I've also come to realize that this feeling I have is not just personal to me, but it's a part of a historical and structural phenomena that includes many other people, and which persists because it has structural continuities from the past that continue to define us and limit us. Personally, I've used this feeling of not belonging to develop my skills as an anthropologist. Now, as an anthropologist, we are usually outsiders. Outsiders who are allowed to live with and learn from the communities that we live with. Now, don't get me wrong, anthropology is filled with contradictions. It was once associated with colonialism. I'll let you guess who the anthropologist is in that picture. But at the same time, anthropologists today, many of us come from the very societies or communities that we study. But more importantly, at the heart of anthropology is the desire to learn from others, to unpack the power relations that allow certain stories to dominate, and to question the assumptions that my or your way of doing things or thinking is the best or only way. Anthropology has allowed me to unearth the ways in which the stories we tell about ourselves are constructed, learned, internalized, but yet how they have long-lasting effects on our moods and our motivations, on our desires and our actions. For lots and lots of people, the desire to belong is already a false starting point. It's rigged because the criteria to belong has already been set up before you even arrived at the conversation. We call this power, 
the power to construct the other and the power to exclude them from access to belonging. Let me give you one example. I grew up in Singapore. And Singapore was a British colony like Canada, where we are now, like in Ghana, where I work as an anthropologist. And like many other European colonial empires, the British like to categorize people, to fit them into boxes in order to legitimate and justify and to more effectively rule over them. Race was one way in which they divided people. And they used it in order to better justify their colonization, their violence, and to make themselves feel or to confirm their feeling of racial superiority. As an anthropologist, I know race is constructed. It's a myth. It's a story told by the powerful. Yet at the same time, if you're Singaporean, if you come from Singapore, race is an important category through which to get to know someone. It is common sense. It's a British legacy that still continues till today. And it is common sense because it is both constructed, but more importantly, it's internalized. So in Singapore, I would be categorized, I am categorized as Indian. And that is written on my identity card that I carry with me everywhere I go. And in Singapore, races come in certain flavors. And in Singapore, there are four flavors of race. C-M-I-O, Chinese, Malay, Indian, others. It's, it's a real category. So being Indian means being racialized. It means being a minority. It also comes with certain assumptions and certain stereotypes. Everyone in Singapore knows what these stereotypes are. And these stereotypes can be transported and transplanted into many other parts of the world. They include one group is lazy, another group likes to drink and is mischievous and are drunks. The third group are hardworking and they're better suited for leadership. Now, why is the third group better than the first two groups? I would argue that this is something that is related to racial privilege. So what is racial privilege? The playwright from Singapore, Afyan Saad, in 2014 posted a blog post and he made a checklist of what racial privilege in Singapore looks like from the perspective of the racially privileged. I'll only talk about three here now. The first one, I can turn on the television or open up the newspapers and see people of my race widely represented. Two, when I am told about our national heritage or about civilization, I'm shown that mostly people of my color made it what it is. Three, I can sit in public transport without wondering if the reasons why nobody is taking the seat next to me or beside me is because I am thought of as being dirty or smelly. Racial privilege is being able to live in social institutions that confirm your presence and that amplify your sense of belonging to the exclusion of others. Personally speaking, and I'm sure it applies to many of you, whether or not you're from Singapore, it is the category of race is one important way of getting to know someone. Gender, social class, where you grow up, the school you went to, even one's accent are other important criteria. Let me give you another example. Each year at UTSC, I teach a class on transnationalism. And in that class, I ask my students to reflect on the question, what is home? Now, most of my students come up with a few criteria for what home is. They include the feeling of security, a sense of a community, familiarity, and a sense of possibility for the future. But more importantly, they shared with me that it was the feeling of being at home here and now that mattered most. Now, most of my students here at UTSC in that class would be considered minorities in Canada. 
And at the same time, they told me that they did not truly feel like in some way they belonged or were made to feel at home here. That for black, brown, non-white and queer bodies, the feeling of not quite belonging is a normal state or a condition that is just every day. Now, this talk is as much about them as it is about me, or it is as much for them as it is for me. The problem is that the structures of race and racism that we live in are part of our everyday lives and are part of the things that make us who we are for both the racially privileged as well as those who are racially marginalized and racialized. In the 1950s and 1960s, a great man who is also from a Martinique, a philosopher and a psychologist argued, Franz Fanon argued, that the long-term stability of racism lies or relies as much in or on the internalization of racist forms of categorization as much as it does on brute force. So what he was saying was that the colonized and the racialized internalize the derogatory ways of thinking about themselves as racialized and over time, this comes to be seen to be a normal way of thinking and doing things and getting to know people. Now, culture plays and serves a similar role in our political landscape today. It serves to differentiate and divide people in order to recognize them. At the same time, it allows people to turn away from racism, from native claims to land, from past and ongoing injustices. So what, I'm, so what am I trying to say? Multiracialism, multiculturalism is and always has been, and what it does is that it deflects the hidden truths and the multiple histories that are found within it at the same time while trying to embrace difference. Now, it's only when the colonial and the historical legacies rise to the surface and become apparent, it's when the cracks start to appear that we can start to see it for what it is, when we can start to acknowledge it better and face it. And I believe this time is here, now. In this recent days, in this time that I call the time of Trump, the structural implicit racism and discrimination and violence that Fanon wrote about and that my students experience is being exposed. There have been increasing neo-fascist right-wing movements and governments around the world that are telling people or making people around the world feel that they're not welcome in the places that they call home. Now, this sense of alienation is being further enhanced by violence, acts of violence against minorities, religious minorities, visible minorities, natives and aboriginals, members of the LGBTQ community, and other marginalized groups. The irony is, and what's troubling about this, is that the people conducting the violence or the perpetrators of violence are the ones who are saying or claiming that they don't feel like they belong in the homes that they call home. That the people in positions of power and influence are now saying that home is not what it used to be, and they want to make their country great again that some of them are claiming that they want to return to an ethno state of a homogeneous race. Think white supremacy. Now, what is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture that I just painted for you? 
Firstly, this exclusive way of thinking about home is deceptive. Why is it deceptive? Because this claim of home that they have, that they don't feel like they belong, is, comes out of one thing, the fear of the other. And the fear of what? The other, the increasing visible presence, their loud voices, their bright colors, their multi-spectral skins. Fear of the fact that people are standing up for themselves and resisting and fighting. And this fear is and has been and will continue to be destructive. So I guess my question for you is, is there a way out? Are we stuck in this vicious cycle of structural violence and racism? Is there a way forward? I think so. And this is what I want to turn to now. I want to make you think about how this feeling of not quite belonging can be used and turned into a more productive, positive force for coming together and for good. Let me turn to an anthropologist in helping me think through this. Victor Turner, an American anthropologist, came up with this idea about liminality. For him, in the beginning, liminality was a middle stage of a rite of passage, a ritual position in which the person going through the rite of passage was stripped of all social status before they could re-emerge into society transformed. Later on in his writing, this is the 1960s, he took the idea of liminality to describe the continuous sense of not belonging that many people feel. To speak about how people who experience this feeling of not belonging or being liminal, being neither here nor there, could come together to form a community or a communitas. In his words, Liminality was a realm of pure possibility whence novel configurations of ideas and relations may arise. Now, there are limits to Turner's analysis, but what I want to emphasize here for us now is that we can also make this sense of liminality or the feeling of not quite belonging and turn it into something positive, productive, to create a community around which we can respond. My message for you here uh, today is a simple one. Make liminality a way of life. If you remember, I asked you a question at the, at the beginning, whether you'd ever felt like you did not truly belong at any point in your life. Almost all of you raised your hands. Now, take that feeling, keep it within you, nurture it, let it grow expand it, multiply it to be able to incorporate and include others who are not like you. Those who are less privileged, those who are marginal or minorities. This feeling of not belonging should be something that comes from within you, that you hold inside you always. And I ask you to take this feeling of not fitting in, of not belonging, of being liminal, to come together with others so that you no longer just turn away in the face of injustice or racism or racial privilege or your own privilege, and that you don't look away when there are people being harassed or perhaps even are targeted. That we come together through this feeling of not belonging in order to face the dark side or the negative side of what I think is too much belonging. So I'll leave you with a quote from a very famous thinker, writer, and one of my favorite men, James Baldwin. He said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you very much. <laughs>